when I take you on my journey, you've got to understand some things. First off, I am not a preacher. And I, uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to help out. And so it's really not going to be a sermon. It's just a testimony of a day in my life and how I got here. So <clears throat> there's really, when I, I've always thought that when someone comes up in front of a group and speaks, you really should know your subject. And there's only really two things in my life that I really know and I feel comfortable talking about. And one of them is, is agriculture or the military. I spent almost 30 years in the service and um, learned a lot there. And so I'm qualified to talk about that, I hope. And <clears throat> another thing is, is that I'm a survivor. And you'll understand why later on. So <clears throat> the name of the sermon is, well, not a sermon, but it's Runs Good, Shoots Good. And first off, I, I, wanna, I want you all to understand too, I, I, it is never my intent to offend anybody. This subject probably hasn't brought up a lot. And just you got to understand where I come from so that you can understand what the thing is all about. So I graduated from Antigua High School in 1973, that's a long time ago, and everybody in my area, when you graduated from school, if you didn't have a name or if you didn't have money, you went to work. And so our neighbors had a potato farm. Angel has a lot of potatoes, and so all of the kids that were in my area, we all went to work at Schrader Brothers Potato Farm, and when we went there, we run guns. Now, that doesn't sound like what it means today. In the, in, we didn't have pivot irrigation back then, so during the day we would run, run these big main lines of water, and then at night then we'd have to run the guns so to irrigate the whole fields. And so the young guys, the newbies like me, we got to go run guns all night long. And we had an international scout truck. And so in the morning, if we did a good job, we would get to go home, and then in the afternoon we'd come back and lay line again for the next day. And the owner of the, the farm... Now, understand this. I wasn't an Adventist at none of this time. So at the owner of the farm, if we did a good job, he would come over there and he'd give us a cheeseburger and a can of Blatt's beer. That was our reward. So I got to drive a 1206 International tractor, which was the biggest tractor at the time. It was really cool. And <clears throat> my uncle was the, a manager of that farm, him and a guy named Bob. And my uncle was the first sergeant in a local National Guard unit. And Bob was a ex Green Beret Vietnam veteran. And they were my managers, and they were really good people to work for. So we enjoyed that. But then one day I come home, and my dad was, uh, he is a Korea War veteran. And my dad, and we had a little farm, just a little beef hobby farm thing. And he <clears throat> worked in heavy construction. And, and finally he says, You got to do something with your life. You don't want to work there your whole life because I was getting 60 cents an hour. And you could be there forever and make 80 cents, probably. So <clears throat> once again, there's not very many options. I wasn't college educated. I really didn't have, ended up in Milwaukee at a place called MEPS. MEPS is a military entrance exam station. So I took the test, and the test came out saying that I had skills in, in maintenance. So I was going to be a, a mechanic at first. So when my dad took me down to MEPS, it's the first time I had ever been out of the Antigo, and I'd never seen an airplane. I didn't know nothing. And he took me to the gate of the airport, and he shook my hand, and he gives me three words of advice. He says, do what they tell you, keep your wallet in your front pocket, and I still do, and never volunteer for nothing. Well, here I am today. <laughs> so some of that I ignored. And I get on a plane, and the first place I went to was <clears throat> Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And I was brand spanking new. Didn't know nothing. You get a little guy from up north and you throw him into an environment like that. I ate grits for a month. I thought it was cream of wheat. I didn't know, I didn't know nothing about grits. That's all they do down there is to eat. And this big old mess sergeant came up to me and he says, where are you from, boy? And I go like, I was scared to death, man. I did and I just said, I'm from Wisconsin. He says, them's his grits. You're destroying them with milk and sugar, you know. So anyway, I got through that. And then the, since I said the ASFAB, the test that I took said that I was, gonna, I was 
mostly skilled at being a mechanic, which in the military, the jobs are called MOS, Military Occupational Specialty, and the, the designators are called, they have a series of numbers, so a, a mechanic was a 63 Hotel 10. So if you're a Hotel 10, you go to Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. So go out there to be a 63 Hotel, and that was 13 weeks that that class was. Remember that, it's a pretty important number. 13 weeks just to turn a wrench. So then, <coughs> after I get out of there, I PCS, which is a permanent change of station, and the first unit that I went to was Fort Hood, Texas. Now, when you leave Wisconsin and you go to Texas, it's different. I, there ain't a single day there that I enjoyed. It was too hot, and they put a military post in the middle of nothing where nobody wants that land. But I was there for a year, and I got to be, I learned my job. And I had a very good leader there, Lieutenant Pennick, And he taught me how to be a soldier, more so than even the schools. So then, uh, <coughs> after one year, then they PCS again. Anybody, does that look familiar to anybody? That's, that's Germany. I went to William O. Darby Kasern in Nuremberg, Germany. And... I don't, I don't, I'm not going to monkey with the laser, but I lived in this barracks right here for one year. And I was a mechanic there also. And we, <clears throat> This was during the Cold War. And the Cold War was, the United States and Soviet Union were fighting over Europe. And they were pretty serious about it. So I ended up, was, went through, everybody here at Checkpoint Charlie? Checkpoint Charlie is, Berlin was divided. Berlin was c controlled on one side by, on the west by the United States, and the east was theoretically, but it was Soviet. You know, the Soviets were there. So I went to Checkpoint Charlie, and there was up on top of the, that's the Berlin Wall. So on top of all these buildings, on the other side of the wall, the Soviets had soldiers stationed with AK-47s and all sorts of weapons, and you did not cross that wall. As a matter of fact, it was, it, was, it was so bad that the people on the east were trying to get to the west and they were shooting them and it was a bad deal. Yeah. And just a side note, <coughs> I, met a, uh, I, I met a family there who that when, this, when the lady was a little girl, her parents took her to the wall and threw her over hoping that somebody would find her and raise her in a free country because they knew that if she stayed on the east side that they would never be free. And they just threw her, and somebody picked her up and raised her. It was, it was, it was quite a lesson that I learned. Um, I actually have a piece of the Berlin Wall. One of the soldiers that I was with there eventually, when they tore the wall down with President Reagan, and uh, they sent me a, a piece of concrete that had graffiti on it, and it had a little piece of paint on it left that was left from the wall. That was pretty special. So then, <coughs> I, after three years, I, uh, I decided I had enough. I liked the service, and I met good people, and I enjoyed my job, but I, I missed home, and for some reason I wanted to farm, which I never figured that out yet. So I came back home, and then my uncle from that first potato farm that I worked for, he came over one day, and he goes, why don't you join the Wisconsin Army National Guard? And I go like, I don't even know what that is. And he says, don't worry about it. He says, we drill two days a month, we take two weeks a year at an annual training, summer camp, and he says, we're never going to go anywhere. Well, that changed a lot. And I said, well, you know, I'm tired of being a, a mechanic. I've been a mechanic now for three years. I'm convinced that if you gave a soldier an anvil, he could break it. And I was just tired of fixing it. He says, no, I don't, need a, I don't need a mechanic. I need a tanker. Well, I've never seen a tank. I've heard of them in the, all the, the three years that I was in. I never really seen a tank. But one time when I was at Derby in that concern in, in Germany, they brought in a low boy, a, a semi-tractor, and on a trailer was piles of metal and junk and steel. Well, it was a tank that got hit by lightning, and the ammunition on a tank is, is triggered by electric bolt. I mean, you can hit a round all day long with a hammer and it won't go off, but if you put one and a half bolts to it, and this thing exploded and it killed the whole crew and everything. So that's the only time I've seen a tank. So 
I go to my uh, the first sergeant, and I says, "Well, I kind of it's kind of cool," and I didn't know nothing about it. But he did tell me that the driver sits here, and up the top is the commander, and the loader sits in here, and way down deep inside is is the gunner. Now that's an older series. That's an M60 Alpha three, and that sits out in front of our armory today. So I said, "Well." How do I, I don't know nothing about it. How do I get trained on a tank? I went, to, I went to school for 13 weeks to be a mechanic. How long is the school for this? And he says, don't worry about it. We got an OJD, OJT program. It's on-the-job training. And so, well, okay. So I joined. So the first formation that we had, I was called up in front of the unit with my uncle was the first sergeant, and there was 88 guys in my unit. And the first sergeant introduced me as his nephew, which he probably shouldn't have done because nobody liked me. Everybody didn't like me right off the bat simply because I was the first sergeant's nephew, so now I'm supposed to be entitled to all the little benefits and everything that goes with it, and he made sure that didn't happen. So I, I got all the dirty jobs just to make sure that I didn't get any benefits, you know. I had a patch on my shoulder from overseas, which most of the guys did not, so that made me a little different, and I was a buck sergeant. I was an E5. The enlisted rank goes from 1 to 9, and I was a 5. Nobody really liked me. So the first sergeant, uh, I was introduced to my platoon sergeant, who was Mike Smith. So he said, hello, I'm your, I'm your platoon sergeant. I'm also your tank commander. So go to supply and get all your gear. So I go to supply. Now, when I was overseas, all they gave me was a toolbox. I had no weapon. I had no, all they call it, battle rattle. But when I get to the unit, now this is a combat unit, so they give me this submachine gun. I didn't even know which end the bullet came out of. Then they gave me a pistol, a pistol, and they, all this mop suit, which is mission-oriented protective posture. That's for your gas engagements and NBC, nuclear. We got an M16, and we got a Nomax suit. And every time they gave me one of these weapons or any of these clothing, they says, well, here's your fire-resistant Nomax, and here's your fire-resistant baklava, and your fire-resistant jumpsuit and gloves. And I'm thinking, like, why all this fire-resistant stuff? And uh, I found out later. So my brother was also in the unit. That's me on the left and my brother on the right. And this is my unit. So we go to the first formation that we have, and this was an anti -goal. So the first sergeant, my uncle, gets in front of us. He says, all right, guys, next month when you all come here for drill, come day early. And the force formation, we're going to get on the little green bus and we're going to drive to the airport in Wausau and we're going to fly to Fort Riley, Kansas and we're going to go out on the tank range and we're going to fire tanks for three weeks. Okay, I didn't, I didn't have any training. I really didn't even know how to get on. I didn't even know where my position was on the tank. So I go to my commander, my TC, tank commander, and I go, hey, TC, what do I do? He says, don't worry about it. We'll tell you when it's time. Okay, he's the boss. So we fly down to Riley, and I, that's a, inside of a KC-135 um, troop carrier. It's an airplane. It's full of civilians. I don't know, that's the only picture I could find. But we pile on there like dress right dress, and you sit with your knees between the next guy's knees like this, and they really they really piled it in there. Right? We had like 500 guys, but we had a couple planes, two or three planes. So I found out later that Sergeant Smith, when they were, he took me as a crew member because he needed a guy, and he made me a loader. And he made me a loader simply because that was a position where you can do the least amount of damage. If you're that stupid, which I was, and gullible, there's very little you can hurt or break in there. You can't screw it up too bad. Driver's position is very serious because to, to, to maneuver, you have to be a good driver. You've got to be an excellent gunner, and you got to, the commander, he knows everything. The poor loader guy, all he's got to do is load. That's all he's, just don't touch nothing red, you know. So um, I'm the loader. So we go to Riley. And we're going to fire what we call these tables. They're tables one through eight. And there are different levels of skill. Like uh, the ultimate is the last table eight is when you do a live fire on the range with your wingman 
and you do a day phase and you do a night phase. And the goal is to get the highest score so you can compete against everybody else. Table 8 is the ultimate goal. So we had, when we got down there, we had 48 tanks. So when we get off the plane, there's a little green bus sitting there. You, know, you guys, anybody watch MASH and they had these little green buses? I know we rode them all the time and Pam would always tease me about because she looks like it's a MASH truck, you know. And so we get on a little green bus and it drives us to the tank part, the Alpha Alpha, the assembly area where all these are lined up dressed right dressed. Now we did not take our vehicles with us. What we did is we went down there and we drew out their vehicles. So by, in the first sergeant we have a formation and the first sergeant gets in front of us and says, all right, you just walk down the line and you pick one. The guy who owns it, the Fort Riley soldier who actually owns it will have a logbook for you. You sign it out, that's your tank for three weeks. Roger that. So I'm, <laughs> you know, there's 500 guys walking up and down here and I don't have a clue. I don't, I don't even, I don't even know who my crew members are, and I'm dragging my duffel bag. I got all these weapons hanging on me and gear. I don't even know how to even put half of this stuff on because nobody's trained me for nothing. And my commander goes up to this tank, and he meets the tank commander, and the tank commander, he's not happy, the guy who owns the tank, because that's his. I mean, he's lived on that thing. He takes care of it. It's his baby. It's his home. It's his family, and I always got to give it to a bunch of new guys from Wisconsin who don't know up from down and he sees me he knows I'm lost completely lost and I'm going to be sitting there loading his tank and so <coughs> the commander gives my commander a logbook he says this is my tank it's got a new tube I'll explain that and it runs good shoots good bring it back the same way and my commander goes yeah, yeah whatever so we load up now <coughs> We had to go 40 miles from post out to the range. And 40 miles of this. All those trails are just, you run these tanks over night and day and they just get beat all to pieces. At the bottom of every hole is water. And the driver's sitting out there and every time he goes on that water, it splashes up on him. It's kind of comical. So <clears throat> we're leaving the post with this thing and, and the commander, he, he comes to me while well, he's in the tank and we got these, we call them CVCs, combat vehicle cap, and they're helmets with, with, mic, with a mic on them. And so you plug into the intercom system, and then you can talk to your crew. So the commander, we plug in there, and the commander says, all right, when we leave this gate, the war starts. So we're, there's going to have people sitting in the bushes. They're going to try to impede us. They're going to try to shoot us. They're going to try to just make our life difficult. And it's your job to ride backwards. We're going that way. And I, I'm supposed to watch the air and the left and right to the rear. That's my job, because uh, I was air guard. And everybody else in the vehicle had different sectors that they were supposed to watch. And I go like, what am I looking for? He says, just anything unusual, just tell me. Roger that. So we're driving along, and <coughs> if you can see, when, the, when the, the driver, when he goes down to a little hole like this, he goes, but when you're up there five or six feet on top of him, and he goes through a hole, it's like being on the end of an antenna. You just get whipped back and forth and back and forth. And my hatch is about this big, and I'm sitting in it. And I'm, every time he goes into a hole, I'm trying to hang on so I don't lose my teeth. You know, I'm going to smack into all that steel. There's nothing, nothing that's protected. And I'm just hanging on for dear life. You know, I don't even know what's, I don't know where we're going. So I'm looking, to, <coughs> excuse me, I'm looking around and back. And the first thing that happens is this is a searchlight. It's a Xeon searchlight. It's about this big. It weighs a couple hundred pounds. Inside of it is a great big bulb, I guess. And it, we use white light and we use IR, infrared light at night. So we can identify targets at night. Well, <clears throat> this light is held onto that, for that tube, that big long barrel, with three little pintles. And there's a great big heavy cord that goes from the light down in through the commander's hatch cord right here and it goes up into the hatch and it plugs into a receptacle inside. Well we're <coughs> we're beating along on these trails and it's so rough that those three pintles break and this light falls off to the side and hits the track. And when it hits this track, we're moving like 30 miles an hour, and when it hits this, it flips over the top of the commander, over the top of me, that's my position, and it hits my track. And then it hits my track and comes back and forth and this thing I am back and forth like a little ball on the end of a string, you know. And every time it comes over us, we're ducking like this, and there's glass flying all over the place. And the commander goes, driver, stop. And so the driver stops right away, and he says, 
we got to stow this thing. So he, he crawls down in the turret and he disconnects the line or the electrical connection. And we take the searchlight and we throw it in the back of the turret where there's a rack where we put all of our duffel bags and all that. So we stowed it back there. Well, in the meantime, <clears throat> when we left post, we travel and we had a battalion. I mean, we travel in companies. So first Alpha Company, they left. They lead. I was a Bravo guy. So I was in Bravo Company, second tank, fourth platoon. So so Bravo. So we're doing here, we're fixing this searchlight, and all the Bravos driving by, and they're all laughing and giggling and waving, you know, and we're, the commander's getting upset because you don't want to lose your place in line. So we got it back in there pretty quick. We got back into the end of Bravo, which is, which is okay. So we're flying along, you know, and in the back of the tank is, this is the back of the tank, and he's got these grill doors. And these grill doors is where the exhaust comes out. This is the transmission, and that's the engine. So we're driving along, <coughs> and the back of the tank was smoking. So I keep my mic, and I say, hey, TC, we got smoke. And he turns on, he looks at it, and he says, ah, roger that, keep an eye on it. Said, okay, what do I know? So we're driving along a little bit farther, you know, we probably go another two, three miles, and it's, it's smoking pretty good. And I go, hey, TC, we got smoke. And he goes, ah, roger that, keep an eye on it, because we don't want to lose our spot. So we go a little bit farther yet, and there's, I mean, there's flames coming out of this thing like it's an F-16 on afterburner. I mean, it's, it's burning. It's on fire. And I keep my mic, and I say, ATC, hey, we got a problem. We, we got smoke. And he looks at me and says, why didn't you tell me we were on fire? And I'm like, geez, I've been trying to tell you for five miles we're, we're on fire, man. He says, driver, stop. There goes my teeth again, you know, because he hits the brakes, and you're slamming up against the steel. And he jumps out of the vehicle, and what I didn't know, because nobody tells me anything, on the side of the vehicle down here, there's a little red handle with a wire braid around it, and he jumps off there and he pulls that handle, and it, it, it ignites three halon bottles inside the turret. They're bottles like oxygen tanks, but they're full of halon. And halon, <coughs> excuse me, takes all the oxygen out of the air. That's how it extinguishes the fire. And they work really good, but there's a real fine powder inside of them, like talcum powder. I'm sitting up there, my tank is on fire, I don't know what the heck is going on, and he pulls a halon, and next thing you know, all this big powder flies up in front of me, and I can't breathe. And I'm thinking, I, what in the world? And I, I mean, I'm telling you, I can't breathe, because it takes, it works good. So I'm trying to get out of this stupid thing, whether I know it or not, and I got my, my CVC cord, my combat, is plugged into the intercom. So I'm jumping off the tank, and I got my head's going like this, because the cord's hanging on me. It's like, it was ridiculous, because I was so gullible. And I get outside there, and I'm trying to catch my breath, and I'm looking at the top of the tank, you know, and <clears throat> the commander, he's, he's really having a bad day. I'm, I don't even know what. So fortunately, so now here comes Charlie Company. They go by us, and Delta Company goes by us, and Headquarters Company goes by us, and everybody's laughing and giggling because we're on fire. And, <clears throat> well, actually, the fire was out now, but it was still smoking pretty good. So the last, we call them trains, combat trains, so the last members of a combat train are the mechanics. They pick up all the ash and trash, that we call it. So they come flying up there, and the mechanics are laughing at us because <laughs> we were looking pretty pathetic, you know. So fortunately, they always carry spare motors with them. So <clears throat> the mechanics are very, very good about it because everything is quick disconnect. And I'm thinking, how many days is it going to take them to put a motor into this thing? Well, it took about 40, 45 minutes. They had a motor out, put a new motor in there, fired her up, Everything run good, and <clears throat> the command by by that time everybody had already passed us. They're all up. You could hear them way off in the distance. They're shooting already. They're they're doing their targets, and you could hear these loud bangs. You know, well we're the only ones out there with the mechanic guy, and so <clears throat> when he fired it up, the commander is now he's very upset, and he says, "Driver, move out. Stand on it." So he just floors it, and we're hitting these like every third bump we're hitting. Because, I mean, we were really clipping along. And I'm hanging on for dear life. Because I, you know, I really, you know, I'm 18, 20 years old. I don't want to be wearing dentures, you know, because it was pounding your head. <clears throat> so we finally get up to the range, and this is the control tower. So the control tower, they have all these lanes going down the range, and the tanks maneuver down all these targets, and they fire them, and the control tower watches through binoculars, and they score you. Well, when we get up to the tower, there's a guy who was not 
Are you? And he's standing there like this, and he's mad, and he's tapping his foot like this. And we drive up to him, and he goes like that. And my commander goes like, "Driver, stop!" So the driver, so the commander gets out and goes in front of him, and it was Sergeant Dular. Sergeant Dular was our armor instructor, our AI. Everybody that had a tank on that post had an instructor that was, he was responsible for us. And he was mad because he's watching all these 47 tanks come through here and he's looking for Bravo 24 and it's not coming and it's not coming and here we finally come, we don't have a searchlight. The back end is all burnt off. And he could tell right away that I was, I was not in the game, you know. So he's telling my TC, he says, okay, first thing you do, you're going to go up to the firing point up here and you're going to bore sight and you're going to um, index your computers. Like, okay, what do I do? Don't worry about it. We'll tell you when it's time. So, so this, is a, this is our target. That's a mover tank. And, and they're way down, they're like three miles away from us and they're behind a berm. You can't hit, if you shot low, you'd hit any of this mechanism and sign a railroad track. But all you can see is the, you see the holes through there that, because the burn protects the targets and that's what we were going to shoot at. So we would go up to the firing line there and we were going to go and do our PMCS, Preventative Maintenance Checks and Services. So we're, the, the, the gunner has a computer and it takes, in, it takes in stuff you won't even believe. It takes rotation of the earth, it takes in barometric pressure, it takes in ammo temp, I don't know how it works, but the drivers, I mean, the gunner's got to plug all this information in with a keyboard, and I'm sitting there like, what do I do? Don't worry about it. I'm, this is getting really old because I'm starting to get a little bit nervous because these things, they're made to kill people, and they're indiscriminate, and they don't care, and I'm the only guy in Kansas that don't know what's going on. So they introduce, so he starts giving me a little bit of information. This is the gunner's position. So the gunner, He's got his handles here that he controls left, right, up, and down movement. He's got, his, he's got three different periscopes. He's got his computer sit over there. And all that stuff, is, it was foreign to me. But <clears throat> this was my position. This is the loader's position. Let me see, where that? Okay. So... The loader is, um, I stand right here. This is called a breach. And I stand here and I take, this breach block will open up and it's got a hole in it. It's 4.134 inches. That's the diameter of a 105 millimeter round. These bullets are stored, what we call a honeycomb. Each one of these is mounted in rubber, and they have a little bracket here that holds them, stops them from vibrating out. That's rubber, because, like I said, that the rounds are fired electrically. So these are the different types of rounds, and we have, well, we got APDS, we got HEP and Heat and Willie Peter and Beehive. All we were going to fire was high explosive anti tanks, because they all fly differently, no matter. Every round has a different characteristic to it, so they fly different, so that the computer, you have to, if you index heat and you fire HEP, it's gone. You're never going to see it, because they, they, they have different trajectories. Well, so, so my job, the commander says, you take these rounds out of this honeycomb behind you, and they come up, and then you got to flip them in your arms and put them, and he says, the pointy end goes in first because that's how gullible I was. And you put it in there, and you, when you're doing all this, you put your palm of your hand over the primers on the back end because you don't want any electricity to get in there. And when you get the round and the mantle, you push for all your worth, and then this block will come up. And then there's a switch that I have to, right here, it's load, safe, and fire. I took that to fire, and then, I, then the commander says, you act like paint. And I go like, what? He says, you don't want to be anywhere near the back of that gun when we fire, so you get as thin as you can up against the hull and get out of the way. Okay. I'm, I mean, right now I'm, I'm shaking like leaf, man. I'm, I'm scared to death. <clears throat> so, 
So, to show you what happened next, I have to explain. This is a brand new tube. I don't know what they weigh, but they're about 22 feet long. And this is what's inside the tank up to about right here. The rest of this is outside the tank. This is called a bore evacuator. This is what I've seen, just this part. Now, between here and here, everybody fired a rifle, you know they have a recoil, you know, they kick. Well, on a deer hunting rifle, you know, it's a pretty significant kick. It'll hurt your shoulder a little bit. Well, when you have a weapon of this magnitude, there's a lot of recoil. So between here, there's a great big three-quarter inch spring that stands about four feet tall, and it sits inside there. And then there's also, in the front, is, there's a sieve with a whole bunch of little tiny holes in it, and it has a hydraulic reservoir that's full of FRH, fire-resistant hydraulic. When you fire that, that spring can only take so much pressure, so then it starts forcing oil through this sieve, and that absorbs the rest of the recoil, and the, the recoil is only going to be about 12 inches. It'll fire like that, and then it'll return what they call to battery. When it returns, it's either in battery or it's out of battery. Out of battery is when it's in the process of firing. Well, if you recall... When we drew that tank out and the commander gave us the logbook, he said it's got a brand new tube. It was. It was brand spanking new because those tubes are rifled and they wear out. And when you, when you lose your rifling, the bullet loses its compression and it just flies differently. So they put in a brand new tube. <coughs> what we did not know was that they did it wrong. And I don't know to this day what, what they didn't do, but it, did, it came what they call it comes out of battery. When it comes out of battery, it doesn't stop. When you fire it, it doesn't stop. It goes until something, it hits something. In a tank, some genius in Lima, Ohio, when they, that's where they're built, when he designed that, right behind the breach there, was just enough for a man to pass through there, is a set of radios. The radios are 24 volt. Everything on a, in a military is 24 volt. Well, it only takes one to fire that round. And we had 53 of them on there, 53 rounds. When they fired that, when the, gun, the, the commander gave his fire command, he said, gunner, heat, tank. I put the round in there. I hit it as hard. I mean, when you're amped up, you've got a lot of power, man. I, I drilled that thing in there as hard as I could. And I hit the switch, and I said, up. And I got up there against paint. And the <coughs> commander said, fire. And the gunner said, on the way. And he hit the little red trigger. Well, I expected it to be a huge combustion, I mean, a huge explosion, something very, very loud. Because when the neighbors were firing, the, comp the concussion from those t tanks came into our tank, and it would just rattle your buttons on your shirt. So I was hanging on for dear life. I was ready for a real kick. Well, when he fired, it just went woof, real loud woof, you know. And then the next thing that happened is the lights went out. Because inside of it, we, we button up our turrets, and we run by red light because we don't want to lose our night vision, so we never have any white light. It's all red in incandescent light. And the lights went out for a moment. And the next thing happened was the flame went up in front of my face, and I started sliding around because it was completely dark for a moment, and then the floor was full of what I didn't know, but it was FRH. It was... It was... Uh, excuse me? Oil. It was oil. Yeah, I lost my train of thought. This part is hard to describe because without being there, without having any knowledge of this, it, you will never understand how bad it was. I mean, it was bad. And my crew knew it. I did not. My crew knew it, and so when this thing came out of battery and came smashing into the radios, there was nothing but sparks. The sparks and oil combined into a fire. We have these TMs, they're, they're Bibles like training manuals. Everything you gotta know is in a TM. So this TM was, I, I still remember it was going around in the vortex, it was on fire and went right out the hatch. And my eyes were, my eyebrows were gone, my mustache was gone. All this fire resistant uniform that I didn't know what was for. Well, there's a reason for it because if it wasn't for that, I'd have been burnt. And the commander, he left. I looked over at him and all I seen was the bottom of his soles of his boots and he was gone. And the next thing I seen was the gunner, he's like, he's getting out of Dodge. He left, crawled up over the commander's seat. He left through the commander's hatch. I seen his boots leave. I didn't know it, but the driver, he, 
he unlatched, he opened up his hatch and he took off and they all run up to the control tower. Well, one of the last things that the commander told me when we started was, he says, when we fire, I never want that tube to be empty. As soon as we fire, you grab another round and you put it around in that chamber and you announce up. That way I don't even have to look at you. I know that it's loaded. I said, well, roger that. So after it fired and went woof and all this was going on, I thought it was normal. <laughs> I had no clue that we were in big trouble. So I'm looking around. I go behind me and I grab another bullet. <laughs> and I'm hanging on to it. And I'm looking for the... I'm looking for the breach and it's gone because it's all, it smashed through the back end of the tank. And the fire went out. We were, well, let me back up. We were never supposed to fire that tank because it was, uh, what we call it was not battle ready because previously when the engine got on fire and then you pulled a halon and it put, put the fire out, you never fire those things without, a fire, without an operational fire extinguisher. Well, that was gone. That was expended already. So we were never supposed to be even that far. So there's no way of putting the fire out. So I'm standing there. I'm the only guy left in that thing. And I'm standing there with it around and looking for the breach. Well, in the meantime, the three guys that were on it, they went up to the tower. And Dular was standing up there. And he knew immediately. He's what, he's what you call a master gunner. He knows everything about that tank. And he knew immediately what happened because the bullet came out of the end of the tube, went about 100 meters and just stopped, dug a hole in the ground, started spinning around and smoking in the dirt. Instead of going like three miles, it went 30 yards. And he knew right away what happened. So he starts, and he's, he's sitting there looking down at, it was downhill, and he's counting bodies. Like, here comes one guy, boom, two guys, three guys. Like, where's the fourth guy? Where's the fourth guy? And it was his responsibility. So he just starts hauling down there to that thing, and, it, and, and it's, it's bad. So he jumps up in his fender, and he knew that the loader was still in there jumps up in his front fender and he crawls back here and he reaches down into my hatch and one of the pieces of equipment that we always wore was called an LBE. It's a load bearing equipment. If you ever see movies or shows where they're dragging a soldier and on their vest they have a handle on the back of it right behind your neck and that's what they grab a hold of and that's how they Well he was down inside that hatch. It was dark. Well except for the fire. But <coughs> he's digging around looking for my LBV and, and he finally finds it. I didn't know what was going on, and he tries to pull me out. Well, I was like 190 pounds, bullet weighs 68 pounds. Dular was just some tall, skinny guy. I don't know how much he weighed, and he pulled me so hard that when I came up, that bullet hit the inside of the turret, and of course, it ain't going to go all out because the hole's this big, and round is that long. So he, and he don't know what's going on, so he pulls and pulls, and I hit this big clink, and he lets me down again, and I'm thinking, what's going on? So then he get, he regroups, and he pulls again, and Clink, hits it again, and down again. And finally, he had enough, so he just put everything he had into it. And he pulled me so hard that that round pulled out of my hands and it dropped it on the floor. You know, I just, I just dropped. That's bad. I'm thinking, when this is all over with, and I open my eyes, the first thing I'm going to be doing is standing in front of Jesus because this is, this is bad. So he pulls me out of there, and he throws me on the ground, throws me off the side of the skirt, their fenders, and I fall on the ground, and then he jumps down, he grabs my LBV again, he starts pulling me up towards the tower, and I'm, <clears throat> we finally get up to the tower there, and my pockets are all full of dirt, and, and my crew is standing there who abandoned me, and <clears throat> I, I still remember my, my TC was going like, I, I go like, what's up? And he goes, <clears throat> And I look at the tank, you know, that's what I see. And he says, I ain't supposed to do that. <laughs> I go like, well, it's news to me. Nobody ever taught, trained me for any of this stuff, you know. So <clears throat> we, we were pretty frustrated, to say the least. So the commander of the unit brought, we were drawing a crowd. I mean, there was people coming from the woodwork and looking at that thing sitting there burning because they, they all knew there was 53 rounds on that thing and, and everybody was waiting for it to explode. And it never did because it was just fire. It wasn't electrical at that point. I don't, Lord knows, I don't know what happened. So then after, after a little bit, they got a chaplain involved. So the chaplain came over to us, and he took my crew, and we took out, I don't think there's only like one tree in Kansas, and he found that tree, and we sat underneath that tree, and he talked to us about Jesus for a long time until we finally settled down. 
And then we had to go back to the range. And the only way you, you get kicked off of a horse, you got to get back on it. So we hot-seated another tank. Nobody wanted us close to their tanks because we had, like, bad karma going on. And nobody wanted to give us a tank to, to shoot for three weeks. And finally the commander says, well, you, you don't have a choice. This crew is taking your tank. So we hot-seated another tank. However, I had about enough at that point, so the commander and I, we sat down and he talked to me for a long time about what my responsibilities are, what the SOP, the standard operating procedure was, you know, what do you do in the event of, and I learned a lot. I wish he would have done that a couple hours before that. So then we went out there and we fired all the way to table eight and I got to the end of it. Well, then we had to drive back to post to turn in all these tanks. And so obviously ours ain't going to drive. So these drag they call them dragon wagons. They're big, heavy trucks. The truck that pulled ours in was operated by a little female. She was a truck driver, and you did not touch her truck. That was hers. We had to load it with a, we had to push it on with a tow bar and everything else. But, you know, that, that's obviously just a picture of it. But we drove that back to post, and... <laughs> My commander, we're going to the Alpha Alpha though, and the guy who owns the tank, he's standing there waiting for it. And my commander gets out of the truck and he gives the guy the logbook and says, here you go. She runs good, shoots good. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the guy was speechless. So theoretically, that would have been the end of the story. A couple, uh, a couple months back, I get a call from Rob. Rob is a guy that I know that's has a, he's an agricultural co-op with, with myself, and he's from Washera. And he calls me. He says, "Hey, Dave, remember that story you told me?" Because I we were talking one day about this, and I said, "Yeah." He says, "Well, I'm going to Colorado, and I'm going out here to hunt, and I got a couple guys in the truck with me, and one of them says that he was at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and he'd like to talk to you." And I go, "Okay." So he gets on the phone, and he goes. Rob's trying to tell me something about a tank that blew up. What, what was the deal? And I says, well, you, you're, a, you're an AI, right? And he says, yeah, I'm, I'm a Fort Knox instructor. And I says, well, then you will simply understand if I just say it came out of battery. And he said, anybody get hurt? I says, well, it broke my gunner's arm. And then it was kind of quiet. And he goes, and you walked away. And I says, yes, sir. He says, people don't walk away from those. That's, you were really, really lucky. After a while, when I'm putting this together, you know, we realized, you know, it, w it wasn't just luck. I was not just lucky. So eventually, the career progressed, and I, I was promoted to a tank commander myself. And then I was promoted to a platoon sergeant, and I was a first sergeant. But one of the things I always did was is that I always made sure that if there was a new guy in the unit, I took him. I didn't care what, whenever we went on the range to do a table, I don't care what we scored, as long as they didn't get hurt and as long as they learned what they were doing because I was never going to put anybody else through what I went through. No more OJT. So <clears throat> that was before I met my wife. That was before I was just a Lutheran. And I bought this farm in 1984. I met Pam. We got married in 1988. Is that right? Okay. I don't want to screw that up. <laughs> I thought that it was my farm. And really, it's God's farm. I just do the work. And I thought... I met Pam, and then you know, we got married. She converted me to Seventh-day Adventist. I was bucking it the whole way. I thought you guys were weird. I thought this Saturday thing, this pork thing, this it's just strange. But I didn't want to have a divided family, so I went along with it for a while. Well, then my daughter Michaela was born. And Pam says, Michaela's going to go to an Adventist school. And I go, like, we got a perfectly good school in town. And you're going to drive 39 miles a day like four times, taking her there, come home, to go get her, come home, take her to the Wausau Church. I said, this is stupid. Well, if you got to know her a little bit, you can't argue with her. So, so she went to, ch went to grade school. And I thought, okay, now high school, Anigo just got done building a brand new high school. 
I go, good, so she can finally come home and not have to make all these miles. Well, guess what? She's going to Wisconsin Academy. Now, that's 149 miles one way. We got 90 cows to milk in the morning. You try to drive down there and see her for a couple hours, then you drive back and did that for four years. And I was fighting it all the way. It's just, it didn't make no sense. Well, guess what's after high school? So now she goes to Southern. And if you think that's a day's ride, that, that's, that's a long ways. So she goes down to Southern for two years. And then she goes to Andrews for two years in Michigan. That was a little better. And I just did not see the sense in it until the very end where I realized that Michaela, first off, she was the first Wilson, the first person that carried my name that ever went past grade eight. Or as you were, 12. And Pam went to Southern. Or no, you went to Andrews. And like I said, I didn't, we didn't go one day out of high school anywhere. And then, the best part about it is, Michaela meets Greg. Greg is from Red Wing, Minnesota, but they met at Southern. And they got married. And they live on our farm. Pam and I lived out in the woods off our farm. So... The Bible verse for today was Psalm 91 11, like Brad read, and it says, For he commanded his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. I don't know what guardian angel really was, so I looked it up on Wikipedia. Wikipedia says a guardian angel is an angel that's assigned to protect and guide a particular person, group, kingdom, or country. Now, I like simple, I like I don't like things too complicated. And I'm sure I'm wrong, and please don't be offended, but I just wonder if God gets up in the morning and he got all this long table and all these guardian angels are there and they're all drinking their coffee or whatever they do, and God goes, today you got Pam, today you got Mike, today you got Joe, and today you got Bob, and he gets to this guy and he says, today you got Wilson, and the guy says, oh, jeez. I was with him in Riley, and I don't want to go back. <laughs> you know? I don't know if that's how it works or not. But I realized that I wasn't lucky. I, everything was a plan. Everything went according to plan. As lost as I was, it worked out, and I'm here today. <laughs>